Hi everyone, my name is James Feeney. Welcome to or back to my channel. It's been a minute since I've filmed a video. I'm going to be sharing some of my favorite items, decks, books, and things like that from the month of September, as well as the beginning of October, because we are a little bit into October at this point, as well as offering some updates on my life, just current circumstances, things that you may or may not be curious about. So if you aren't, that's all, that's all good. I'll, I guess I'll start with a bit of updates just because I think they're applicable and to just get them out of the way. I have missed some of my videos, as I said, or upload schedule, been a little bit off and away from work and the online world. I did have, I was sick, I did have COVID for a few weeks and that just kind of threw me off. Honestly, most people probably would not realize that I wasn't very active on Instagram or YouTube. I forget who said this to me, but it stuck with me basically to the effect of just that nobody cares as much about what you're doing as you do. So things like, you know, social media and uploading, there's a good chance that although you feel your own absence or lack of presence in a certain space, others are much less likely to notice it. And I find a lot of comfort in that rather than feeling like any of us might be overlooked to me, I think that is a little bit empowering and it's nice to know that you can kind of take a step back and most people will not bat an eye and probably not even realize you're gone. But for anybody who is curious, that was just where I was at. And in recent months, I've had, you know, trouble kind of keeping up with a lot of the, a lot of other YouTube videos, videos of others in the community. And that's mostly been about just being busy. And here I thought, you know, I'm, I'm kind of sick and out of the loop, but I can use this time to watch those videos. And I actually had trouble watching videos of others in the community during that time, mostly because I didn't feel like I had the energy, you know, to participate. And I guess it's that kind of feeling like when you're a little kid and if you can't have something or you can't, you know, be within a certain thing or a game or whatever that you almost don't want to feel tempted or to watch others who are doing that or have that thing and so uh, I found myself watching a bunch of random things like uh, architectural digest home tours and van life things and the myriad of other things that I'm not actually in actively engaged in and those to me felt like an escape I also thought I was going to get a lot more reading done. It turns out I got even less reading done. That was mostly to do with my energy levels and just not even really feeling, you know, like I could do that. Then I actually got well enough to be able to, you know, rejoin wor the world a little bit. And within the first few days, I did have an event, which I'm really grateful that I had, you know, to be able to read tarot for others and and I wanted to get back into my work in that way and I was happy that I didn't have to cancel that it worked out perfectly with timing but then I was reading all day and I actually having just recovered and then subjecting myself to that I lost my voice completely for about two or three days I mean I was able to make it through that day but I woke up the next day with with no voice and it's still a little bit hoarse and so I was like oh I want to film a video you know it's the end I want to film my wrap up from September and I didn't have a voice to do it so I had to wait a few days so it's kind of been just a series of events where it's like one thing after the other but I'm here and I do have some things to talk about and so I'll just it's a nice easy casual way to get back into filming and without further ado I'll begin to share we'll start with the decks make our way into the books, and then I guess miscellaneous random items and experiences, although I don't have any miscellaneous items, so spoiler there. Uh, I guess when it comes to decks, the first one I'll share, and this one might be a bit of a surprise, I don't think I've, you know, talked about it before really, is Pamela Coleman Smith's Rider Waite playing card deck. Essentially, it's just the Rider Waite Smith, but in more of a playing card style and format. I think it's very fun, it's visually interesting, it's small, it's dynamic, it sort of has this playful and old school feel at the same time. This is what the backs look like. It's a thicker deck, it's that semi-gloss cardstock, it's pretty thick. I like that it comes in already a hard box, so you don't have to really, you know, decant it into any sort of bag or other type of, of holder, which is nice. It's the, the same images but you kind of have it done in that way where you get the corner with the element or the suit and the number. And then as far as courts go, all of the knights are jokers. I guess that's how they 
rationalized it in keeping with the playing card style, and so it seems to work pretty well. I've really been enjoying it. I was actually using it while teaching my class, my tarot class that ended not all that long ago. I found that it was great visually for representing the, the numbers because, you know, with a normal Rider Waite Smith deck, you just get the Roman numerals. But when I laid these out on the table for visual examples, it was easy to see, you know, the numbers in the corner. So I found it to be a great learning tool. Although it's a little bit smaller, I had a small class size, so it was easy to have people gathered around and like to orient it in that way. So I used it for teaching, but I have been using it for daily draws as well. I actually do really like the Rider Waite Smith and I've just found that this one's fun and easy and it's great for throwing it in a bag and going to the park or something like that. I love decks that are kind of small and portable and in hard little cases because I'm usually carrying a tote bag when I go anywhere. And honestly, when I'm doing a lot of my work, if I don't have to be home, I'll go out somewhere to do work. And so this is always nice to have on hand for purposes like that. Now, as far as other decks, they're going to be a little bit more boring and things that I've spoken about before. I just have a Marseille deck. The one that I've been using the most is the Hodorowski. And so it looks like this. It's vibrant. It's colorful. I know some purists don't like it for the changes that he's made. I tend to think that the colors are great for clients, and this is probably my most used client deck of the past month. It's pretty striking and bold, and so I think it's visually interesting and it keeps somebody sort of engaged in what I'm talking about. And of course, all of the symbolism is very clear and bright, and so I appreciate it for that. And so there's that one. The other decks are just, I'm not even sure if I'm going to pull them out, but I guess worth mentioning the Pagan Playing Cards. Uh, Pagan Playing Cards, yes, this is the Ivory Edition, the one that I always show. It's the one I use the most. Looks like that. Not very exciting, but I always have a playing card deck around for use. And uh, I also usually these days now keep a Lenormand deck on hand. That's just going to be the Green Glyphs Lenormand, which I'm sure many are familiar with. It's a beautiful deck. Looks like this. I do separate out the little card. There's alternate cards and I don't use, you know, I use the core deck and so keep the alternate ones on the side. And that is, I think that's about all with the decks. I guess there's this. I went away right before I caught COVID and it, yeah, I kind of discovered that I had it while I was away, which was not ideal. But um, while I was away, I got these. They're called the Posi Vibe uh, Fortune Telling Dice. It's more of like a kitschy, fun thing. I've kind of found that they're not very practical for use, at least the way that I divine, but I can imagine it being really fun. I mean, I've had fun using them. So comes with a little booklet. There are eight different die. They're all the same, so they're all going to have the same sequence of things. It's not like each one is different. So you get a star, crescent moon, pyramid, a sun. What else do we have? A lemniscate or infinity symbol, question mark, sun. What else? Did I miss anything? No, it's like six sides on a die. Um, so there's that, um, or I guess there's a smiley face too, or maybe some of them are different. Wait, now I'm just realizing that maybe some of them, yeah, some of them are different. They're not all the same, um, you know, uh, Hamsa or just like the hand and the eye, rainbow, heart, peace sign, half moon, um, half phase, um, smiley face. That's it on that one. And so I guess there's two different types, maybe three as I'm dropping them everywhere. I'm making these discoveries right alongside as I'm filming this video, but I haven't used them very much. They are really fun, but it tends to be more affirmation and positive. Of course, they're called the Posi Vibes uh, die, so it's not gonna tell you anything super you know, hard or constructive. At most, you'll get something a little bit ambiguous and vague. I just thought it looked fun. It was kind of in a shop and it was one of those, you know, things that looks exciting and fun, like you'd like it, so you get it. I don't know. I've been just toying around with them. Maybe I'll find a purpose and I can kind of sculpt the way that I use them in a way that works better for me. So that way they don't just sit on the shelf. Time will tell. I'll report back. I guess now we'll talk about books. And so two that I fully finished in the month of September. Yes, the month of September are um, a deadly, this is called A Deadly Education. It's a novel by Naomi Novik. 
I think that there are going to be more books in this series if they aren't already out. This one, I'm not sure if it's YA or young adult. It might be. It kind of has that feeling considering it takes place in a high school. It's in more of like a fantastical realm where magic exists. However, it's quite dark and, you know, it's violent and dangerous in this world. Uh, there are magicians or young magical practitioners. Of course, magic takes place or exists in a more fantastical way where, you know, things are flying and this and that, and there's a school that the children are transported to, so it's in almost like a different dimension, and you're there for four years, and there are monsters and all these bad things, essentially, that I guess are drawn to their magic, and so I think it's something only like 40% of any given class graduates or survives to graduation, but I guess that's better than their odds outside of the school environment anyway, so, you know, things are a little bit bleak right at the offset, and the school is essentially very deadly uh, and you have to really learn quickly and it's not easy and there's actually no teachers it's kind of like this sentient school in a different dimension and things are just odd and our main character sort of has an affinity for darker magics despite the fact that that's not what she actually wants to pursue and it's it's very interesting i would say and if you know it's almost like if harry potter had more of a dark turn with some more, I guess, like realistic, but maybe even tending on the more pessimistic side of the way things could be. Um, I found it very interesting. It was punchy. It gets right into it. It's very action oriented. I would say there were parts I feel like that could have been better. You know, it's a little bit corny. However, it moved along really well and the world building I, I valued a lot. Some of the characters fell flat for me. The main character was actually great, but the surrounding characters kind of just felt all like, you know, auxiliary forces that I didn't need to invest in. Um, but the world, I really appreciate the world that the author took the time to create. It's all very fun and interesting. Uh, I definitely would recommend it. I'm probably going to seek out the others in this series at some point. Next, we've got Guidelines for Understanding the Essentials of the Birth Chart by... Stephen Arroyo, or it's Chart Interpretation Handbook by Stephen Arroyo. He's quite the well-known author and astrologer, uh, author of astrology books and astrologer. Uh, it's a it's an older book, I suppose. I guess a lot of his books were written in, I want to say, the 80s, uh, if not a little bit before and maybe into the 90s, but I've read a few of his books. This one just seemed like a staple, and I really love reading beginner astrology books just to get all of the information I can. And so this one did not disappoint. I think the way he con has this sort of conceptual idea of astrology and using it, I think it's easy to get lost in the details. And for example, you know, to become very formulaic and just take, for example, a birth chart and read it in the way that you've learned and, you know, take this, this plus this means this. And really you have to add a human side to that you know, lived experience will tell the things that we see in a birth chart are not necessarily, at least the way I see it, and I think the way that it seems Stephen Arroyo sees it as well. You know, it's not t deterministic. We are working with what we've got, and so, you know, there could be two seemingly very similar placements or things going on in a birth chart and the way that they're exemplified by a human being and, being, and our experience is going to be very different. So this wasn't exactly cookbook style, which I appreciate. It went through certain, you know, placements, pairings, examples, but it did kind of give it to you with a grain of salt and made it more digestible, I guess. So I like the tone of his writing. I think he's brilliant. And so this one was, you know, I knew I was going to like it. Next, we have two books, one of which is not, well, I guess both of which are not complete. One is um, Octavia Butler's Lilith Brood, or I guess that's like the series. It contains the complete series of Dawn, Adulthood Rights, and Imago, I guess would be the third. So it's three novels in one. It's a little bit thicker. It has very thin pages. I, whenever I see thin pages, I think of like the Bible. I call them Bible pages because Bibles have excruciatingly thin pages. Uh, at least that's what I remember growing up. So there are three novels in here. Each one's about 250 pages. I finished the first one in September. I'm currently, as of like the first week of October, almost done with the second one. And so, yeah, right? I'm about to be, 
yeah, I'm just about at the end of the second one, and then I'm going to read the third one. So it's very interesting. I read her series of four other books. I forget the names of them, but they were science fiction. She was a writer in, uh, most of her books were written in the 80s, I believe. This one's science fiction as well as the other series of four books. I did one of my, I did, I think I did my first book mapping video with a book from that series, and I read the other four. I've talked about them at length in various other videos, so I decided to pick this one up, and it hasn't disappointed. Essentially, what's going on in the series, the premise, is that the world has ended, and aliens kind of swooped in as humanity was dying. There was a nuclear war, which then, you know, killed a lot of people, an actual war which killed people, and then that altered the environment and made Earth really cold, which then was about to wipe out the rest of people. Aliens came in, took people. We have our main character, Lilith. She's kind of awakened on this ship. The aliens are highly intelligent. They're compassionate. I guess their biological drive or purpose in the universe is to trade. They call it trading, and trade is a big theme in these books. They're trading genetics, so they like to find other species to kind of mix their genetics with for like a next generation, and that's something that they're kind of driven to do, uh, but they do have humanity's interests at heart. They want the people to survive. They saved everybody that they could from the planet. They found ways to, you know, to toy with genetics. Everything's very natural. They're on these ships that are actually alive, and everything's connected. It's very cool. The way Octavia Butler's mind works in building and like all of the details and building these characters that you become so invested in. I think she is, she was leaps and bounds ahead of her time. That's first and foremost, the way that she's able to kind of predict the way humanity tends and just these very deep themes. And she doesn't shy away from very gruesome, hard things. Things that happen in her books are, can be difficult to read in terms of, you know, humanity and taboo topics. Um, things like race and class are definitely brought up and not shied away from. Things like trauma and sex and human dynamics and society, they're, they're all delved into in great depth. But there's this, you know, science fiction and fantasy-like element that makes them feel a little bit detached in a way that you might be able to that might be a little bit more palatable, I would say, than if they were foisted upon a reader as uh, very realistic fiction, if that makes sense. Now, the humans in this book, in these books, do really get on my nerves. I actually find myself siding with the aliens a lot more, and it's funny because, yeah, there's just a lot of that kind of thing going on. But it highlights, I would say, the faults, the flaws, the vices, the the darker parts and the lesser parts of humanity that, you know, we as humans can probably connect to in reading this, but also find very frustrating. Um, the world building's great. The first one is essentially taking place primarily in space. We have the idea of waking up the people, figuring out why the aliens are here, what they're all about, what's going to be the future of humanity and Earth and the kind of relations between the aliens and humans. And the second one, we're on Earth. I guess maybe that's a bit of a spoiler, maybe not, but I mean, I'll just say that that's that, where that t it takes place on Earth. There are the humans and the aliens, and of course, I haven't made it to the third one yet, so I'll have to report back. I'm in the second one, but would highly, highly, highly recommend, as well as her other series. I forget the name of that series. I know there's, um, it's a series of four books, and I know she has other books, and I actually was reading this in a coffee shop, and just like a day or two ago, and somebody came up to me, and it was this guy who said, you know, that's my wife's favorite author. She'd be so happy to see somebody else enjoying her books as well. Uh, it turns out, you know, the wife showed up. I guess they were meeting each other. She came over, and she's a part of a book club at a university near me, and she invited me to join, and I thought, like, oh, that's so nice, and they're actually reading one of Octavia Butler's books, and it's the one or a series, or at least maybe it's a one-off book. It's one of the ones that I haven't read, actually. I think it's called Parable of a Sower, Sour, Sower, however you pronounce that word. I, I usually say sower. Um, and so, you know, it's, yeah, it was just very interesting. Small World, highly recommend this series so far, and I'll report back as I finish the second and third ones, although I'm mostly done with the second one. Next, we've got one that I haven't finished. This one I've been struggling with, and being sick, this was like at the time I was reading it, and 
you know, it just wasn't easy to make it through those books that kind of have a little bit more density and weight to them when it comes to reading. So this is Relating, An Astrological Guide to Living with Others on a Small Planet by Liz Green. Really enjoy this. I honestly have preferred more old school astrology books to the very modern ones. I think there's, I love that there is such a wealth and breadth of books out there. You know, we have a lot of options currently and there are a lot being made, but I also think the quality is, you know, a little bit less. I would say there are really good modern books out there on astrology. That is true. But there are just so many, it's hard to know what you're going to pick up is going to be good. And for the most part, most of the modern ones I picked up, I found disappointing, very surface level. Um, they just were not doing it for me. I don't think that they were teaching me very much. And so I've been, you may notice even as I've spoken about astrology books that most of the ones that I've read are the ones that were kind of written in like the 70s, 80s, even 90s. Um, and I tend to find that a lot of the, the works and, and notable names who were writing at that time have a lot of depth to them. And, you know, they were really critically thinking and diving deep with astrology. And it seems like a lot of these newer ones, it just seems it does not do it for me, a lot of them. So if you have any recommendations of really good modern writers out there writing about astrology, who are, you know, really getting to the core and it's meaty stuff, um, I'd be curious. I'm not really looking for cookbook type things um, and not as much in the realm of beginner, um, but yeah. So this one I really liked, not to, not to hate on modern writers. I do think there are some good ones out there, but there's just so much out there. It's hard to wade through the whole sea that we have now to find the good ones. And so I am definitely looking for them. Uh, this one is, it takes more of a psychological, humanistic, approach to astrology. I think that that was a big theme going on in the 80s. There was that sort of movement in psychology and spirituality. You know, things were, it was popular at the time and they were merging the two worlds. Uh, so far, so good. I have only a little bit left or I would say, you know, I've read two thirds, maybe three fourths of this one. I had found this in a shop in Philadelphia a couple months back and I actually didn't buy it when I saw it in the shop. The reason for that being that somebody working there was just, they were really mean. They were rude. Uh, for lack of a better word, you know, this person was a, a bitch. They were a bitch. Um, and yeah, it made me not want to buy anything from the shop. I, you know, looked around for a little bit. The experience in the store was unsavory to say the least. They were just, they were so rude. I didn't even actually ask them anything. They went out of their way to come up to me and look at what I was looking at with a friend and you know, give their two cents. They were not very nice. I tried to remain as, you know, deferential and pleasant as possible, but they, it, yeah, it was not a good experience. And so part of me did not get it from that store just because of the principle of the matter. And I did not want to support them in any way, whether or not they were the owner, I don't know. Um, so I went, I sought it out online, got it eventually. So this, yeah, it was a long time coming, but I knew I was interested in this book. Now you got the whole story. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm enjoying it. It's interesting because, of course, you know, culturally speaking, societally speaking, we know a lot more about certain things than, say, you know, we're known at this time. I think Liz Green is a wonderful author. I've read other stuff by her, I believe, as well on astrology. And this one is definitely not a cookbook. It's very uh, it's toying with the idea of astrology, essentially. You'll get some astrological like, knowledge to learn about. This is not a beginner book. It assumes that you know certain things, and it's essentially talking about basic, larger psychological concepts. Jung is definitely the primary source going on here uh, and his theories, and we're using astrology essentially in tandem to explain or taking astrology, breaking it down through that lens, and talking about certain things like mothers and fathers, like the relationship between a child and parents um, on both ends, talking about interpersonal relationships, talking about romantic relationships. So it's essentially talking about the way we relate to ourselves and others, taking astrology and psychology and speaking very generally about these things, taking case examples that Liz Green has as an astrologer encountered, which I think is really valuable if you're looking for real examples of charts and interpretation. There's a little bit of that going on in here. Um, and take it with a grain of salt, you know. I know that sometimes we read older books and 
there are some things in there that wouldn't be acceptable nowadays. And then there's like the one side where it's like, oh, you know, it's not acceptable regardless of the time. We probably just shouldn't be reading that. It's outdated. There's the other side that's like, take it into account. You know, that was where they were at the time. Generally speaking, they didn't have the same, you know, knowledge. They didn't have the same resources. They, the environment was different. And I tend to take that approach a little bit more so that I can still gain what I can from it without totally shutting down, you know, for example, there's a chapter on, you know, like, or a section, I guess you could say on like sexuality, for example. And it's easy, obviously, for me as somebody who is gay to take this and the way that it's spoken about in the 80s, written by an author who seems to not actually be, you know, gay themselves, speaking about that as an outsider and what they kind of knew or thought about, you know, homosexuality or being gay at the time and be like, oh, you know, that's a little bit cringe or that's not, I'm not sure I'm on board with what you're saying here. Um, not sure that's the way we think of it now. It's easy for me to, you know, say, oh, I, I might want to shove that to the side, but no, I'm, I think that there's still something to be learned, um, especially just, you know, knowing where people were at at that time, how it was generally received. And of course, this is an author who was trying, who was, you know, very open. It, clearly, they were trying to do their best here but they just, you know, weren't, they just didn't have the knowledge. Society had not caught up. Um, yeah, so it's very interesting to see just an interesting sort of like cultural element there or societal timeline element there. I think it's more interesting than it is um, a turnoff. But if that's something that, you know, might make it be not something that you don't want to read, then just know that going in. Um, that being said, I guess that about, I guess I'll have one miscellaneous item. That just being my astrology planner, which, you know, I've shown before. I kind of showed it in a little bit more depth in former videos. It has my birth chart in it. It's showing all of the transits going on. It's also showing anything that's activating or kind of creating aspects and transiting in a way that's affecting my chart. Um, there's a lot in here. It's personalized to me. I value it. I, you know, I'll schedule out my week in there, but I also will write predictions based on certain transits. It's nice to see, you know, the moon cycles are all clearly laid out. I can see where any of the planets are. I can see, you know, more objectively transits that may not even be, you know, directly impacting my chart, but then I can also highlight or see highlighted transits and activations in my own chart. And based on that, you know, I'm going to make little prediction. So it's great for me to practice my astrology. And as far as planners go, I'm definitely one that sometimes falls off and ends up not using them. I'm very guilty of that. I'll get planners, think it's great, use it for a week. And then it kind of goes, you know, the way of the dinosaurs and I'm not using it. This one, however, for the past couple months, I've been actively engaging with it each week because it is visually interesting because it's, you know, I want to keep up with my astrology studies. And so I find that I'm using it to, you know, put my um, weekly planning events in it, but then also utilizing it in other ways. So highly recommend. Uh, I usually leave a link when I talk about this. I'll try to remember to do that here. I think it's from a website called Honeycomb, something like that. And yeah, it's great. I actually found that on TikTok. TikTok is in some ways, sometimes it, I find it very frustrating because, you know, you've got the whole peanut gallery speaking about whatever on there. And I don't agree always, but, and sometimes, yeah, there's, I could, make a whole video on on my experience i guess in as a viewer on tiktok when it comes to spirituality magic astrology tarot but um there are some great finds on there and that was one of them that being said i hope you are all well let me know how you are all doing and the things that you're enjoying what you thought of the things that i had to share uh love to have that conversation going on excited to be back into making videos hopefully and i hope you are all well like and subscribe if this was fun or interesting. And until next time, bye.